Uh, thank you for joining us here today. I'm Joanne from Worth Electronics, and this is Mel. Yeah, I'm Melanie Kleine. I'm working at KQ Prime, and actually, since university, Joanne and me are doing several projects together. And today, we want to have a look into DC biasing. First, Joanne is the one starting, and um, then I'm the one finishing the presentation. For better audio, we change to microphone now. Let's see that. Um, share. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Okay, perfect. So the topic for today is the search for the best DC bias components. Uh, I will start off with a short introduction into the topic, and then we will split into two main categories. Um, the first one being RF block. So we will have a low current and a high current example. And then we'll talk a bit about the DC block, how to make the best selections. And before we finish, we will give a short um, yeah, information about how to use measurement data for your simulations. So when we're talking about combining RF signals and DC sources, we can think of many different applications. Here are just some examples, um, mostly from communications. So for example, your GPS device, when you receive signals, and similarly, when you design a satellite, LNB, or a wireless Wi-Fi router. When we have a look into it a bit further, um, and use this example, for example, a camera system wired in a car. We have here a, I don't know if you can see my cursor, we have here a yellow cable, which is most likely your video signal. And then we have a red um, connector here as your power cable. And when these two combine here at this junction, um, then you only get one line with both RF and DC into your camera. So yes, this is what we're talking about today. And um, for our presentation today, we've categorized it into narrow band and high band. So the applications here we um, define as narrow band because they receive a um, smaller range or smaller frequency range signals. And then when we talk about um, broadband, we're thinking more of a wider um, frequency range, so from a few hertz to gigahertz. A good example of this is a gain amplifier. As you can see, um, we have a schematic here, and the biasing network is a very critical part within the RF circuit design for the overall performance. So. Um, when we think about ways of how we can design this gain amplifier in order to utilize its full, I guess, frequency uh, broadband capacity, then we can have a look here at um, one option is to choose different components. So for example, in this schematic here, we can have a look at the RF block, so this um, RF inductor component. In many of the cases in data sheets, we're recommended for certain narrowband or certain frequency um, applications or the band that you want to use, a certain L and C, a certain L and C um, value. And so it's not as mobile in case when you need a more broadband um, application. So a lot of the times we're given a lot of narrowband um, information and today we want to explore broadband. So our question for today is how to achieve a good RF throughput for broadband applications. To summarize, when you have wrong DC biasing, um, naturally you will lose your RF signal or you'll lose some of it. And vice versa, when your RF signal gets within your power line, it could be that you can filter it out, but when you filter it out, you generally filter everything out. So um, we'll focus on um, 
yeah, brought back applications with DC biasing. Um, again, our th three main categories, I will continue on with the low current. So I have an application example here up to one amp. And then Melanie will continue on with the high current. So more than one amp. And then to finish off with a DC blocking capacitance information. So firstly, a low current example. Back to the gain amplifier with a similar um, design, we have created here a RF and RF DC um, board. So when we want to combine RF and DC, the first thing we want to think of is to make sure we have a good PCB design. So here you want to bring out all your RF techniques and apply them. For the RF track, make sure you check your line impedance. You want to make sure your, your application um, works well with your system, if this is 50 ohms or 75 ohms. Um, you want to make sure you avoid solder masks. So in a lot of the cases in RF designs, you'll see that you don't actually have any um, solder mask. So it's the green top layer covering your tracks because they create more loss and um, they can also change your line impedance. And it's also good practice to have these via fences, so the wires surrounding your signals. This is to make sure you have more control of your signal and less coupling effects. Component-wise, you want to minimize the amount of stray parasitics you have. And um, for other electromechanical components like your SMAs, you want to make sure you have good grounding, so also wires surrounding it. Um, for today's example, here with this diagram, we can see the S parameters, S11 and S21 we'll be focusing on. We have a RF signal input, then it gets combined with a DC in, which has a filtering system before it joins together as an RF output. So S11 will be the reflection of your RF input and S21 will be your throughput from RF in to RF out. Now we can have a look at some of the results. Um, a key point for the RF block is to make sure that you have a high impedance value so that you can get the widest possible range. So the standard approach is usually an RF inductor. Here we've used a um, with Electronics KI part it is a wire round ceramic inductor. And if we jump over to the graph, we can see in this S parameter um, results, we have two curves. One is S11, your reflection, and one is S21. So usually for reflection, you want the attenuation to be as low as possible. For this application, we've drawn a line here at minus 20 dB, but anything from you know minus 15 or lower is generally good. As for your throughput, you want your um, curve to be higher than minus 3 dB because usually by minus 3 dB, you lose half your signal. Yeah. So in this application, we can see that it is already quite broadband. You know, we're using uh, pretty good from 400 to about 600 megahertz. However, we can see that it likes to resonate. Inductors like to resonate. And this could be with other components on the board, for example, your filtering capacitors, or resonating by itself, since inductors generally have a high Q factor. Um, in general, we can see here that there are some peaks too, so it's not suitable for anything lower than 400 megahertz in this case. Next, we will have a look at a different component that also has um, can reach this high impedance um, specification that we need for the RF block. So here, uh, an unconventional approach that isn't really used is, for example, to have a ferrite bead, a high frequency ferrite bead. Overall, in comparison with the RF inductor from the previous slide, we can see in red the ferrite bead consistently stays below the minus 20 dB line. So that means it has a really good reflection. 
and we can also see for the throughput that it's quite stable and um, as an advantage the ferret bead doesn't um, resonate compared to the RF inductors so we don't see any you know big changes or peakings um, compared to the RF inductor so we can see here it is much more um, broadband we've extended the same but we've used the same application but extended the range from about 30 megahertz to 7 gigahertz. However, there are also disadvantages with ferrite beads. So, for example, they have they generally have a low current rating. Um, hence, we've categorized this in the low current application. Um, or that ferrite beads saturate when you have a current bias. However, there are always ways around this. Um, for example, here uh, with the DC application, we've now given it some current, so 0 0.1 of an amp, and have a look at the results again. So there isn't much difference compared to the previous graph, but we can see that the inductor itself is doing what it is good at, um, resonating um, here and there, but for, and the ferrite is staying more or less consistent. So here we've decided to use two ferrite beads to make sure that even though the ferrite does saturate and give you a lower impedance, it can still maintain the impedance in saturation with this doubled impedance. And the good thing for ferrite beads is that even if you have two, they don't resonate with each other. So they, that's why you don't see um, any peaks. Therefore, Choosing the right component can also help you, um, you know, have a better application. In this case, a broader application. Um, not not only just any chip bead ferrite would work. Here we've looked at using a CBF HF. So the red one we've been seeing consistently is a high frequency ferrite bead. However, we also have other ferrite beads, for example, the CBF series or the TMSB series. But we can see that for both the CBF and the TMSB, they seem to be more like each other. And they also show you know, some peaks and um, the further, uh, the, further uh, the larger the frequency, um, it's starting to head up the reflection. And for the throughput, it's starting to be lower than minus 3 dB. So in this case, during these bands here, um, a chip bead probably is not the best solution for uh, this application in terms of like a different chip bead. But it can still be usable, you know, for a good 4,000 uh, 4, megahertz, 4 gigahertz. So the result is um, make sure, you know, you, you have a look at the components you're using, not every single part would be suitable for your application. Um, in order to do this, we have a Red Expert. It's an online database of all our components, and you can easily select the ones you're using. For example, I've selected the three here I've shown today, and um, you can graph and check out the, the electrical um, specs, compare them, and it's also available that we give the current bias. We do the current bias measurements and provide at, you know, at point 0.1 of an amp, how much it's either saturated already or so on. So yes, this is a very nice tool. You can have a look if you haven't already. And to summarize my part, um, we've looked at two different um, components. The first one is the RF inductor, um, which can be used quite nicely. However, it likes to resonate. Um, for this application, it's not so good for your low frequencies. On the other hand, um, we can see that by changing the component, but keeping to the, to the spec that we want for a high in impeding component, then um, the chippy RF is a better choice. You don't get as many resonances and um, we've widened the frequency range. So yes, um, overall, make sure you have a look at different inductors or ferrites or whatever components you want in your application and um, yeah, do the adjusting from there. <laughs>
So now I will pass it on to Melanie. Thanks, Joanne. And to be as Florian, can you hear me? Okay, super. So I will proceed with a uh, high current because Joanne's approach is actually just for current ranges up to one amp. And sometimes you do have application that needs to be higher in current. So what shall you do? Okay, let's go back to the um, original theory of a bias T. A bias T actually is built up of an OF block and a DC block. But now let's just focus on the OF block itself. The OF block typically is just built up of one single inductor, as this inductor is really low in um, impedance and resistance for DC, mainly just its R DC, but it's really high impedant to the RF. Nevertheless, it could be that just one inductor may not be broadband enough for your application. Then what shall you do? Um, the thing is you can then try to cascade, or actually you need to cascade then um, the structure within the RF block. But unfortunately, you can't just use inductors. You may need to put in resistors and capacitors. Why is that so? Let's have a look at this example. I've built up a three-staged RF block here. So one stage is for the high band, one for mid band, and the closest to your power supply for low band. And as you all know, an um, in normal inductor gets capacitive above its self resonant frequency. So what happens then in high band? Um, it could be that L1 here is still an inductor whereas L2 is already their capacitance. Therefore, they start to resonate with each other. And we don't want to have that, so what shall we do? There comes the resistor and the capacitor in pi. Um, if you choose the capacitor value that way, that it's an R with short at the resonance frequency from L1 and L2, it connects the resistor to ground and therefore the resistor can damp this resonance effect between L1 and L2. So what values should you choose for the components within the RF block? Um, as lower in frequency you get, as higher you need to choose the capacitor and inductor value. But with the resistors it's um, different. Because when you come from the power supply, mainly, not all, but mainly the power supplies would like to have a low resistive load, at least in the area they work at. So the resistor nearest to the power supply, here in this example, R3, is much, much lower in value than the other resistors. Here I would say roughly like several ohms, like two, three, four, five ohms, something like that. Whereas the other resistors need to be chosen in the value accordingly to the impedance of the inductors. So they are more likely in the range of several hundred ohms to kilo ohms. Um, and to clarify a bit the behavior of this RF block, I've simulated um, an F block with one stage, two stage, and three stages, and compare them to each other. In the first picture, you can see the filter like characteristic of an RF block. So, as more stages you have into uh, your RF block, as more broadband it gets. But of course, the RF block will have an impact on your RF throughput. But if you choose the components wisely, you can minimize this effect to less than half a dB. So, but how to choose, what components to choose? So, for inductors, the rule of thumb is having a look into unshielded or semi-shielded inductors, as those have no, just little saturation over current, and thus they keep the inductivity constant. Also, from those, you want to have a look at the RDC value to have it as low as possible to have a small voltage drop, at least the smallest voltage drop you can get <laughs> over your RF plug. And thus, you might have a look into the PD2, PD4, HCF, or SD series from root. 
but especially with the SD series. Um, as it is a wire wound ferrite inductor on a watt core, it has a wider magnetic field than compared to the power inductors. Thus, it could happen to couple within the RF block or to your overall system. And then with the, for the capacitors, it's important that you choose one that it's stable over voltage. So for example, for the MLCCs and NPC series one, or you could also choose electrolytics. But be aware, you can't change your voltage polarization on fly then when you use electrolytics. Good, to sum that up, um, and our FBOX function is to have uh, the lowest possible um, resistance to DC so that you don't lose any power over your RF block and to um, provide a really high impedance for your RF. And if you have a broadband application, you may need to cascade then um, the circuit within your RF block to achieve a wide broadband behavior. For the components, you could have an eye on, you should have an eye on um, semi and unshielded inductors with a really low RDC. But be aware of coupling effects with those inductors. And for capacitors, you could have a look at the MLCC's NP0 series or also electrolytics. Now let's have a look at the DC block. We kind of neglected the DC block in the last two chapters, and now we want to focus on that. Um, a DC block characteristic is to block DC and to let others through. Typically, you can just use a capacitor for that, but this capacitor determines you the voltage range you can use within your system and also your frequency range a lot. Um, before we go deeper into the capacitor, I just wanted to um, tell you that it might be suitable for your application to have an ESD protection in front of the DC block. Mainly, for example, if you have an external signal generator to protect that one, you could build or design in an ESD protection just in front of your DC block. But remember, um, our F signals have a positive and negative part, so you might need to use a bidirectional ESD protection. But let's go back to the DC block capacitor. Typically, the DC block capacitor is to be chosen as an MLCC type, as mostly you would like to have a it is broadband as possible. And um, then for the MSCT types come in handy as you can use them above the self resonance frequency. Thus, you need to have a look at those MSCCs that have a really low ESL and ESI. So the rule of thumb here is to use the highest capacitive value of the biggest possible size that fits into your RF track, like shown in the picture below. We've chosen here a capacitor that's kind of big and it fits in perfectly nicely into the RF trace. On the graph on the right side, I've compared several um, with uh, capacitors to each other. So uh, 06, 03, 10 microfarad, and 0402, 4 micro 7, and uh, 04 to 100 nanofarad capacitors. And you can clearly see there that the 10 micro and the 4 micro 7 do not differ that much from each other on the way, um, on its uh, impedance over frequency. But the um, 100 nanofarad is much less broadband than the other two. So here it's this rule of thumb is kind of, um, how to say, validated with, um, yeah, um, with this graph. And uh, you should focus on this, yeah, rule of thumb then. Okay, but what if you have extreme range applications? For example, a high voltage application up to several hundred volts or kilowatts, then 
those safety and high voltage type MLCCs may come in handy for you, like the CSMH or CSSA series, but they are much bigger in size. So be aware of your line impedance on your RF track and may you need to talk then to an RF specialist so that he can figure out a way that you can combine your RF track with those big MLCCs. And when you have an extreme broadband application, I'm talking here about hertz to uh, so gigahertz, like five hertz to several gigahertz, then um, maybe this um, trick of combining two capacitors with each other comes in handy for you. So you can stack up two different capacitors, for example, an MLCC and an electrolytic or a tantal, as shown here in the picture, where the MLCC is for the high frequency and the electrolytic or tantal for the low frequency range. Um, and you should always have a look that the small capacitors is directly on top of your line, whereas the big capacitor is above the smaller one. Uh, and be aware of resonances between those two capacitors, so you should choose um, two that work together nicely. Um, also wanted to mention, of course, there are special capacitor types available on the market, but typically they are really expensive. So to sum up this chapter, we were talking about the, uh, the DC plug, and um, you should have a look at low ESR and ESL capacitors. And for MLCCs at least, you can use this rule of thumb of using the highest capacitive value of the biggest possible capacitor size that you can fit into your system. And for extreme range, you uh, may have a look into high voltage MLCCs for high voltage application and maybe combined to capacitors by stacking them up for extreme broadband applications. So, um, last chapter. Um, we were talking about like the circuits and bias T's and so on, but um, how, like, how do you mm, make sure that the, uh, the bias T fits into your system? You could do that by building up the um, bias T, going to your lab, measure it, save the RF measurement data, for example, as a touchstone file, and then um, convert it for LT spice into a simulation lib file, and then put it into simulation. So you can have a look at the behavior of the um, RF bias T um, together with your overall system, for example, with your power supply or with loads or whatsoever. Um, even though some uh, simulation programs provide you the uh, opportunity or the yeah, opportunity to just um, include those measurement files directly. And that's actually nearly it. If we sum up the overall presentation today, we have been looking into um, our F coils and ferrites for low current applications. If you're facing problems with your RF coil due to resonance effects, or maybe it's not getting on low frequency enough when you have a broadband application, a ferrite or an RF ferrite might come in handy as it's not so likely to resonate and it's much more broadband. And thus, the ferrites can improve your broadband RF throughput by a lot. Um, unfortunately, they don't work for so much on high current applications. So for that, and when you have also a broadband need, you may go back to the original design of an um, bias T and cascade the RF block. Therefore, using semi or unshielded inductors with low RDC and capacitors that are stable over voltage. With these tips and tricks, you are now able to um, create a system that has a great RF throughput and, near, and a nearly disruption-free power line. <laughs>